Welcome. My name is uh, Rami Eitan. I'm a GYN oncologist from Israel. Uh, and as today's moderator, I want, would like to welcome you to the second IGCS COVID-19 Project ECHO. We know there are many demands of your time and we trust you will find tremendous value in attending today's session. We have almost 300 attendees today from uh, 60, 60 countries around the world. We're very, very happy for that. Uh, as information regarding the understanding of COVID-19 is continually evolving and care of our patients is rapidly changing, our goal is to bring together the global community where we, we, we will discuss gynecologic oncology cases with special consideration for COVID-19. A few housekeeping notes on ECHO, format, and etiquette. If you wish to see all the panelists on your screen, please click gallery view in the top right corner of your screen. If you wish to only see the person speaking, you can select speaker view. We will have a case presentation followed by a didactic and close with a question and answer segment. Panelists will be the only ones able to speak during the presentations and attendee microphones will be muted. We collected questions through the registration process and additional questions may be submitted during today's presentations via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible but cannot guarantee we will answer all submissions. I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. Uh, our case presentation will be given by Navia Nair, Assistant Professor in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans in the United States. The case will focus on issues in the management of locally advanced cervical cancer in the era of COVID-19. Our didactic lecture will be presented by Jalid Sehuli, Director of the Department of Gynecolo Gynecology with Center of Oncology Surgery and Deputy Director of the Charité Comprehensive Cancer Center in Germany. Jalid will be speaking on COVID-19 and the management of gynecologic oncology from the perspective of the Charité Comprehensive Cancer Center. On our panel, we have Henny Botta, Associate Professor from Stellenbosch University in Trigerberg Hospital in South Africa. Ann Gerda Zal Eriksson, Senior Consultant from the Department of Gynecologic Oncology, Division of Cancer Medicine at the Norwegian Radium Hospital and Oslo University Hospital in Norway. And Thomas, Thomas Samuel Ram, Radiation Oncologist, Professor and Associate Director at the Ida B. Scudder Cancer Center, Christian Medical College in India. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Navia for the case presentation. Thank you. As Rami said, my name is Navia Nair and I'm a GYN oncologist at Louisiana State University in New Orleans. Before I start with the case, please note that Project ECHO case consultations do not create or otherwise establish a provider-patient relationship between any IGCS volunteer clinician and any patient whose case is being presented in a Project ECHO setting. Responsibility for the patient remains with the medical team who cares for the patient at the presenting institution. So let's begin. So this is a case of a 74-year-old female who initially presented to the emergency department with an inability to void. Evaluation revealed a large pelvic mass that was the source of the patient's symptoms. Uh, the patient had no significant past medical, surgical, or family history. Of note, the patient was a frequent traveler and um, often flew to and from New Orleans for work. On physical exam, the patient was of a normal BMI. Exam under anesthesia was performed due to her uh, significant symptoms with a bedside exam, and that revealed a six centimeter firm mass extending down the vagina to the level of the introitus, completely obliterating the vagina. The mass was fixed and extended to both pelvic side walls. A cystoscopy was also performed at that time, and that revealed friable nodules at the posterior base of the bladder. Multiple biopsies were taken of both cystoscopy and the tumor within the vagina. In addition, imaging revealed right hydroureteronephrosis. 
and a right nephrostomy tube as well as a Foley catheter were placed. Pathology on all the biopsies returned as a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, uh, given the extent of disease extending into the posterior bladder base, this placed the patient at a stage 4a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. And on the right, you'll see that the tumor stained positive for P16. A staging PET CT was done, and on that PET CT, there were multiple ground glass opacities noted with low level hypermetabolic activity at the peripheries of both lungs. In addition, the known cervical cancer was also seen and that was noted to be hypermetabolic as well. Of note, there was no lymphadenopathy in the pelvis, periaortic region, or mediastinum. The PET-CT, um, the lung findings were read with a differential diagnosis of metastatic disease versus an infectious or inflammatory process. The recommendation was to get a dedicated chest CT as well as consider a lung biopsy for further evaluation of these lung findings. Here are some images of the PET scan. On the left, you see the CT component, and on the right, you see the PET component. The arrows are pointing to these ground glass opacities, and on the right, you'll see uh, the hypermetabolic activity that is noted. And here is another image of the PET. The imaging was re reviewed by the treating clinicians, myself and the radiation oncologist, and we felt that the lung findings were unlikely to to metastatic disease given their distribution and the fact that there was no upper abdominal disease. The patient was very symptomatic from her cancer and we decided to go ahead and start treatment with definitive chemo radiation while the chest findings were being worked up concurrently. A chest CT and lung biopsy were planned to be performed. However, before that happened, COVID-19 entered into the differential diagnosis. Given this possibility, additional testing was canceled when we felt that it was important to get this patient tested as soon as possible for this virus. Um, at that time, we did not have rapid testing available for asymptomatic patients, so this actually required hospital administration approval to get this patient tested. The patient was brought in, the test was completed, and 24 hours later, the test returned as positive for COVID-19. Throughout this period, the patient remained asymptomatic with no fevers, cough, no shortness of breath, and no known sick contacts. So we were left with one of three options. One, we could hold the treatment that had already been started for two weeks. Two, we could hold the chemotherapy alone for two weeks and continue the daily radiation with appropriate personal protective equipment. Or three, we could continue the treatment as scheduled with appropriate personal protective equipment. Navia, thank you very much. We are now uh, going to open up the panel for discussion of the case. And uh, Dr. Ram, I would like to start with you as a radiation oncologist in the group. What is the standard of care, regardless of the COVID-19 uh, diagnosis, what is the standard of care therapy for a patient with stage four locally advanced cervical cancer? Yes, I've been seeing this uh, particular patient and uh, we know that most of the current guidelines uh, currently recommend uh, concurrent chemo radiation. Uh, as uh, Navya has also just mentioned, that's what they plan for this patient, uh, especially for when there's a minimal bladder and rectal involvement. Uh, but we have situations sometimes where we have a high volume uh, stage 4 disease. Uh, so some people can consider uh, starting with like a neoadjuvant chemo for three to four cycles, see how the patient is uh, responding and then a more radical treatment is uh, offered. Uh, in a scenario where there is a very extensive rectal or bad infiltration and the patient has significant mainly obstructive symptoms, uh, then after a suitable uh, diversion, uh, some of these patients are uh, offered uh, palliated uh, hypofractionated uh, regimen. Okay. And, and now that you know that the patient is COVID-19 positive, how would you uh, change your approach, if at all? 
Yeah, so in the context of uh, COVID-19 uh, being positive in a patient, and uh, I can share it from the more of a perspective of uh, uh, how will you handle this in a, a low resource uh, situation. Uh, the principles which uh, normally like to follow is what we'll do for risk mitigation and the preparedness uh, to deal with this kind of a situation. And the factors uh, which, uh, which primarily come into play in this situation is factors which are related to the patient and factors which are related to the resources available at that particular uh, center. So, so the whole concept of uh, risk versus benefit ratio uh, needs recalibration in the situation. And also the resource optimization and prioritization uh, strategies mainly for the treatment uh, needs to be uh, redefined. And uh, as far as coming to this kind of a particular patient uh, in a low resource setting, uh, we know this patient is elderly patient. She has uh, lung findings suggestive of uh, and she's COVID uh, uh, positive. And if you look at uh, the data, which has uh, just come out from uh, China, where some few patients were treated uh, for cancer and they were COVID positive. And those who are having increasing age and they have received treatment for less than 14 days and had, had uh, lung findings, uh, they had a higher risk of uh, severe illness. And hence this patient though is asymptomatic for a COVID related illness, but the findings which have just come out uh, places her at a high risk of risk for developing severe illness due to COVID. And the other risk of this kind of a patient, again, in low resource setting is the probability of exposing, uh, say, the other patients and the exposing. And we are working with a very limited uh, staff in the departments. So those factors have to be considered because, again, the accessibility of testing in this situation, accessibility for appropriate PPEs in the setting is still a challenge in, in many areas. And also it is a huge resource constraint, uh, again, in low resource settings, especially when you have a patient who goes into the machine area for treatment and the protocol which needs to be followed for cleaning up uh, the treatment area, the machines, especially each vendors have their own protocol, which kind of chemical can be used. So in a situation like this, it is very resource draining activity. And uh, the same thing stands for the treating professionals. And there is an urgent need for resource uh, optimization. So if this particular patient um, happens to be in a low resource setting, uh, I, would, I would suggest that this kind of patient, we defer the radiation therapy and the patient be given care in the hospital as per the national guidelines for a COVID positive, but an asymptomatic patient. And some people suggest that we do because we need to see when we should start treatment for this patient. Uh, weekly testing can be suggested till the patient becomes negative and this will be desirable. And uh, once the patient becomes a negative, a thorough clinical evaluations to be done uh, to reassess uh, the level of the COVID related illness and then take a call on uh, restarting the treatment uh, as well. So that is what I feel uh, from the low resource perspective uh, is a suggestion from my side. Okay. Dr. Bota, I'd like to ask you, um, first about the case, Dr. Nair uh, showed us the results of the PET-CT and the confusion it initially uh, caused in treating the patient. Um, what is your take on using images in these, uh, imaging in, the, in, in these circumstances? Um, well, good afternoon. First of all, I think um, when we um, see imaging, um, we always need to um, use the information we get in combination with clinical evidence um, of our clinical examination um, of the symptoms of the patient um, in order to make um, a decision um, about further clinical management. Um, in this case, <clears throat> I think the PET-CT potentially um, showed um, lung metastasis. We, um, from our unit, Anna Simons, um, published a series of patients um, with locally advanced cervical cancer, <clears throat> um, about 280 patients, um, of which about 30% were um, living with HIV. Um, so in our population, many patients will have HIV <clears throat> as a comorbidity and also things like TB, um, which can significantly change the picture on something like PET-CT. Um, and I think the, 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 the answer is really to, to, to speak to the um, um, colleagues at um, uh, nuclear medicine and to have a multidisciplinary team um, to make a decision about the, 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 the patient's management. And, and I think in this case, um, Navia showed that the <clears throat> um, CT showed no um, 
but I ought to go with lymphadenopathy um, and with lung, um, uh, sort of potential lung metastasis, and that, that, in my opinion, wouldn't really make sense. So I think whatever imaging we use um, in staging and in treatment needs to be put into context of the, of the entire patient. Do you screen all patients for uh, COVID-19 these days in South Africa? Um, <clears throat> at the moment, I think we're still in a fairly early phase of the, um, of the epidemic. Um, we definitely screen everybody that enters the hospital with a, a series of questions. Um, you know, all the simple things like fever, contact with somebody with um, symptoms, um, etc. If they screen positive, um, then um, they will be offered um, testing. So I think every single person that enters, enters the hospital will be screened, but not necessarily tested. And I think testing, um, Navia, um, I think you said earlier that you are now testing all your patients um, um, in, the, in the system, which I think is uh, difficult if we, I think we, we just wouldn't have the resources to to do to test all our patients, um, but I think screening um, and testing those with positive um, screening results is really the, the, um, the way to go. And I think it also depends a little bit on where in the epidemic you are <clears throat> in your um, environment. Um, if you have very few cases of um, community transmission, I don't think it makes sense to to test everybody. However, if there is a lot of community transmission, it might be a different situation. This, this patient, her only risk factor was travel, basically, right? She didn't have, and she was completely, completely asymptomatic. Right. This is an asymptomatic patient. And Gerda, I just want to ask you a, a last question before we move on. How would a patient like this be, be treated in the Norwegian uh, Radium Hospital? Hi, Ram. Thank you for that. Um, so at the Norwegian Radium Hospital, any patient that um, presents with a new um, cervical cancer, will um, undergo a CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis for metastatic disease. And um, importantly, and maybe differently from what's been presented here, we always do a MR, MRI of the pelvis. And that's really to evaluate um, locally the main tumor and its extent. Um, we also feel that we get um, a better sense of uh, possible nodal metastasis in the pelvis with an MRI versus a CT scan. Then we also do an exam under anesthesia with all our new cervical cancer patients, both with um, an attending from our radiation oncology team and our uh, GYN oncology team. And if the patient is not thought to be a candidate for sur surgery, then we will also do a PET scan before we plan for um, chemo RT. And in this case, you know, we would really heavily rely on our radiologists. Um, and in regards to if this was felt to be uh, metastasis in the lungs versus infectious disease and COVID, um, because this is very important in regards to the, the therapy. She's, this is a symptomatic patient. She needs to initiate her therapy um, shortly. And we also know that the therapy that would be most helpful for her now is radiation. Um, you know, if this was a large tumor and we felt we needed to shrink it to give curative uh, radiotherapy, we might start with neoadjuvant chemo. Um, however, that wouldn't really help her symptoms um, that quickly, very likely. Um, so if we felt that we needed a biopsy, we would try to get this. And then, you know, we'd look at the potential risks of transmission of disease, both to the staff there and other patients. But also we would consider, you know, what are the risks to the patient? It's rare, but you could have complications like pneumothorax, which again would delay maybe initiation of her definitive therapy. Um, so I think once we, we have as much knowledge as we can, we would go move forward as well with chemo RT okay. and with intent for this woman. So uh, Navia, can you wrap it up to, uh, for us? Uh, what, what did you end up doing? Yeah, and I, I do thank you for mentioning what you did, Gerd. I do want to also say that um, we do also rely heavily on our radiologists, but at that point, PET findings of COVID were really not widely published. And so it was not something that the radiologists really knew to look for at that time either. There was a question about whether the bladder biopsy was positive, and I just want to confirm that both the cervical, vaginal, and bladder biopsies were all positive for squamous cell carcinoma. So we were left in a difficult position because she, we, she had already started her definitive treatment, and then here we were with this COVID positive result. Um, and we had an interdisciplinary discussion with our cancer center director, our lead infectious disease physician about the risks and benefits of continuing her treatment. 
We felt that chemotherapy would be too high risk to continue given that these infusions last six to seven hours and she's in the infusion center with other immunocompromised patients and our staff. So that was held for two weeks. Um, the radiation did get, a, did get held for a few days while all of this workup was being done. We looked at the risk benefits as, as Thomas had very well put um, about continuing her radiation versus holding it. And at the end, we decided that if the patient was masked, treated at the very end of the day and remained asymptomatic in that she was not coughing or aerosolizing particles, um, we would continue with her radiation treatment. So that's what happened. She continued the radiation, but she came in masked and she um, uh, was the last patient treated so that they could uh, sterilize it after her treatments were complete and she's currently ongoing with her treatment. Okay, so good luck. Um, before we move on, I'd like to ask the attendees, feel free to send in questions through the Q&A. Uh, we'd be glad to, to try and answer as many as we can. Uh, we're going to move on with the didactic portion of today's presentation with uh, Jalit Zahuli, please. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I think it's really a global challenge that we have to share our experiences. And before we go to a didactic uh, story, I want really to underline that this situation is very unique. And we, we never had such a situation. And you see on the, on the map, next slide, please. Um, that it's really a global uh, challenge that we should be very careful now to define statements for the whole next future. So it's really important if we start the dialogue, how we deal with our gynecological cancer patients at this crisis to be aware and to be honest, how was my infrastructure before COVID? What was my best infrastructure for what disease? And how was my communication channel with my medical staff and even with my patients? And then to look how we do it now, because at the moment we try to define new standard operating procedures and to fight against COVID-19. But the next evolution point will be how to live with COVID-19 and how I can go back to my philosophy to give my patient the best evidence-based medical approach and how close can I go there and second is what environment do I need to preserve my treatment environment even in a such crisis. So this map show you two days ago that we skipped the two million people milestone. And I just checked it today, we are above 260,000 now. And I'm really happy that we can even share our experience from Europe and from Germany. The next slide, please. And you know that the colleagues um, from Italy have maybe the primary first uh, big challenge that then the colleague from France and we are in Germany have at the moment an infection rate around 0 0.7 and the target was below one. So with the activities with distance of people at least of two meters that we recommend that even people only be in touch in a in a very limited uh, social environment, uh, we reached this target. And the next slide will show you that even in Italy, where we have very, very high patients with uh, cancers and non-cancers in, in one moment, um, we are very happy that the plateau is now going to a drop-down curve. And if you look which patients are in risk, yes, there are some young people, but mostly there are patients above 65, 70 
and AT. And what is really crucial is that this patient, even the first patient who died in Berlin, was a 95-year-old man with three comorbidities. And to be sure that if we talk about deaths based on COVID, that we don't disseminate maybe the biology of the original disease. I think we need several months, maybe several years uh, to discriminate at the end of the day what death was really induced by COVID-19 and which was not. So at the moment, everybody is counting everything and that's fine to get a feeling. But even the next slides um, show you that if you compare the mortality rates, it's maybe not correct and even not scientifically based because the definition of COVID-19 changed by country to country and second is the availability of testing and how I test is so completely different. So in our center we test every day 3,000 uh, people in our lab. So we have the ability and we started last week even to test the medical stuff regarding antibodies on IgG, IgM, um, to look how many people are really asymptomatic. And even the policy in our center um, is that only patients who have symptoms or in the case of differentiating diagnosis will be tested uh, routinely. So the next slide will show you that really we are at the moment stable in a fragile state. So that's the reason why uh, we are not so restricted uh, in comparison to Austria or to Italy. And even on Monday, even bigger shops will open uh, beside the supermarket and all the things because at the moment the healthcare system is not really afraid to be overwhelmed um, by uh, the COVID-19 patients. Next slide. Only to show you that we talk about risk patients. Yes, but the data are very marginal. At the moment, there are some data um, retrospectively, it's clear because nobody was, um, was uh, preserved about this uh, challenge, but some data showing in lung cancer and even in comorbidities that patients who are under cancer treatment or have comorbidities are for higher risk on the death rate, what is maybe between 10 to 50% if the patient have to go to the intensive unit care, that's the general uh, mortality date. Next slide. Um, show you again that patients who are under treatment are maybe compromised and that maybe uh, give us a signal that these patients should be protected. And that's what I even follow Navier's case presentation. I will, will wait for two to three weeks and we will discuss in a few seconds that treatment delay is not really harming in every patient, in every situation. So I, I really like to be, um, to have a break maybe in this case before I go uh, to my treatment I, I want to offer to my patient. The next slide, please. So it's very really important that we communicate with our patients because what I mentioned now, um, that many patients are afraid to go to doctors, go to hospitals, go to the doctor regarding the symptoms. And you know, for instance, ovarian cancer, patients have in general a long history of three, six, seven months. And at the moment, my feeling, because elective surgeries, elective treatments are reduced um, radically, that this maybe will extend the time to the final diagnose in, in many diseases. Um, and that's the reason I think it's very important that we educate our doctors, our staff, but even the patient that they have 
some possibilities to reach the doctors. So, and in general, again, the benefit of cancer treatment is higher in general. And I only want to be sure that not only survival and cure is the end point, it's the target of my medical intervention, even progression-free survival, symptom benefit, quality of life, all the targets where we have fighters several years that we introduce treatments is a target. So nevertheless, it depends on your resources, it depends on your prioritization, but at the end of the day, we have to offer our best practice to our patient. So, and if we be honest, sometimes we do too much. In Western countries, even in developing countries, sometimes we do diagnostic without the question, is this really necessary? And what is the clinic consequence for my patients? One example, CT scan, and CR125 as treatment model monitoring and bearing cancer. For what? There are thousands of data showing that even biomarkers, enough or ultrasound or clinical examination to monitor treatment effects during tra cancer treatment. It's not an argument against complete diagnostic, but we should be balancing our medical intervention. With the, at the end of the day, we want to protect our medical staff. We want to protect the patient and their relatives and that's the reason we have to limit the resources to the necessary touch points. And that's, I think, very important. We always talk about comorbidities, poorly pharmacy. Yes, if you have a comorbidity, what is under control, the risk for death is significant inferior than if you have an uncontrolled comorbidity and cancer. And that's maybe a point what we should address even beside COVID-19, go to a prehabilitation to improve the healthcare status of the patient. And that's, I think, one one on uh, the crucial point at the moment. If you have a patient with COVID, try to improve her health. Yes, you have to control the cancer, but it's always a balance of health protection and cancer treatment. And that's the reason why I'm very much enthusiastic if we make a break if it's possible and I'm, I believe that in many many treatment situations we can uh, have some, some break. So and I just published and I have seen every day of new publication for everything. Be careful please my colleagues, please careful because that most of them are emotional based. They're most of them are nice to read but they are without any evidence. And it's nice to have some rules, but be careful. And we are scientists, we are doctors, we are the, the models. And don't, trans, don't translate one result of a few study to a big patient cohort. So for our center, we adapted the communication between the colleagues. It's crucial that we continue medical, do more work than what, what we have today. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a key point of our success. It's a key point of individual treatment recommendation, use video conferences, telephone uh, stuff, um, instruments and all the things and try to reduce your uh, uh, transits. So I only give you a feeling. So my center, we have at the moment more than 350 intensive unit care beds. That's before COVID. And with COVID, now we increase the number to 500. At the moment, we have 70 men and wives in our intensive unit cares with COVID. We have 11 patients with ECMO, but 85% of the intensive unit care are free because we reduced all the complex surgeries to 50% to train the staff, to train um, the structures for COVID exclusion awards to intensive unit care separated and focused, dedicated only to COVID-19. And we have even introduced post-acute station, including palliative wards only for COVID because how to say goodbye to my lovely relatives if I don't can see them and don't touch them. It's new structure, no environment. 
And so it's a big challenge to make new structure in our hospital. And in my center, we continue with sick cancer surgery, reduced them to 50%, but every day we are able to, do, to deal with two big surgeries. And I'm, I'm happy and we will increase the number in the next weeks. So diagnostic surgery therapy, medication, maintenance treatment, cancer care. I, I love everybody, even my colleagues, but I think there's no indication to stop maintenance treatment. If you have to control cancer treatment, why I should stop it? No, try your change how to deliver the drugs to the patient, how I can um, preserve patient safety by using video calls and all the other instruments. But I will not stop at the moment uh, my cancer treatments if the patient's under control. Cancer care, yes. What do you mean? It's early detection, it's more long-term survivorship, yes. Then you can moderate and prioritize, and that is what we do. And you can ask the patient, make a water in, uh, in your cap, and you will see how is the situation of the patient. And we have to deal with this even in other fragile situations. So next slide, show you that again, the key points are what can I do? What should I do? And what is allowed that I do? And that's maybe a conflict I will touch up later a little bit. And again, what's the patient condition? And what can I do to improve this situation? And how I can protect this patient not to go to intensive unit care, how I can protect my patient to go in a fertile complication. That is uh, the, the challenge. So what the limitation are, it depends on your center, on your region, on the rate of, of the infection rate, on the curves, and it can touch thousands of things. So we introduce a special surgical uh, space for patients who are known COVID-19 infected and because the intubation is a critical thing and you know that at least 50 to 30 minutes the virus particle can be in the air in the air and that's the reason why we have special teams who will do the intubation in COVID-19 patients and they're mobile and they jump from one department to another department and they're special trained for this. Next slide. So think about the patient's perspective. We will start a global questionnaire about this, um, how we can uh, communicate with a patient. Do they trust us even after or with COVID? How we be criticized for our communication, for our prioritization? Did we enough be aware of their needs? And the same is, again, what's about the patient's perspective. And I think we need some special um, circumstances for this because I feel even sometimes powerlessness because there are so many SOPs coming from the pandemic um, conference and every day we have new recommendations and new prioritizations that's not simple to deal with this. So next slide please show you that many um, initiative started to try to, to make it much more transparent. What is the basis for prioritization? Is it the age? Is it the possibility to be cured? Or what is the resources you have to take it? So my personal attitude is we have to separate not with high and low complex surgeries. We have to think about which centers is really necessary to do complex surgeries or cancer treatments and which centers are not. I think it's not the right way that one center deal with all problems of the world to do the best brain surgeries, to do, to do the best uh, chemotherapy trials. And that's uh, the thing what I really not supporting to do based on age a prioritization. That's in Germany forbidden. In Germany is forbidden to prioritize based on age. It's unethical and it's, it's not allowed to go to this. But nevertheless, we have some ethical um, um, recommendation 
um, what is not really translated in real worlds. So next slide, please, showing you in endometric cancer some examples. Yes, you can delay. In general, for all solar tumors, there's a window of 42 days up to eight weeks without compromising the efficacy. Sometimes you believe the worst cases might be treated earlier than the good cases, but no, it's vice versa. In general, if you really want to cure patient, then maybe time frame is relevant. And if you have a patient with residual tumor mass of a brain cancer, no, it doesn't matter if you start treatment after two weeks, four weeks, up to eight weeks. There are thousands of evidence uh, for this. Next slide, please. And that's the reason why I, I suppose in, in, a, in endometrial cancer, you can postpone, but that's not my, my uh, goal. My goal is the best treatment with the best environment. So if you, have, you are blocked in this case, okay, then I will stop. Yes, you can do a bridging by anti-hormonal treatment in hormonal sensitive type 1 endometrial cancer, but in general, bridging is not used by anti-hormonal treatment. And that's what uh, was published by Pedro and all um, our friends. Um, it's, a, it's an idea how we can deal with this. I'm not supporting the approach that minimal invasive surgery should be um, deleted. I think that's wrong. You have to, to adapt your uh, safety materials. Next slide. In surgery, independent from open and minimal invasive, and I will show you uh, a slide in a few seconds. Cervical cancer, vulvar cancer are the same. You can postpone, that's indirect evidence. We don't talk about bleeding and all the symptoms. It's in general, you can wait three to 10 weeks in general without compromising. There are some ideas about this. Next slide, that's without any idea. That's not the right studies to discuss neoadjuvant chemotherapy in COVID. The, these neoadjuvant trials are for patients with very, very advanced diseases. And in this case, the surgery or no surgery have no difference. But we talk about optimal divide in 50 to 80%. So that's not helping these studies to give arguments for this. We don't do neoadjuvant in the setting uh, during COVID-19 in our center. So, Ovarian cancer, but even in other diseases, the maintenance approach is touched, is very important, not only for BRCA positive patients. And that's the reason why we continue, we change a little bit the safety modifications uh, in blood, co uh, blood accounts and imaging, but in general, we continue this. And again, even for maintenance treatment, you have a break, possibility of a break at least of eight to 12 weeks after chemotherapy to start with the maintenance approach with uh, PAP inhibitors, for instance. Next slide. Jalid, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up. Can you yes, I'm, speed I'm, it up? Yes, I'm close. Uh, to how many? Two minutes? A uh, minute and a half. No problem. So that's, again, and you can download this later by the IGCS um, uh, webpage. Next slide, please. Um, and we use GCSF in chemotherapy based on the mask and the other criteria. The next slide, please. Again, there's no contraindication, my personal opinion, for maintenance treatments. And so before surgery, we use PCR testing in a, in a difference rating diagnose. We extend to all gyne cancer CT, uh, CT scan. Next slide, um, we have some ethical conflicts and I will show you one case uh, even with a CT scan. Next slide, you see a patient and you see, uh, I, I, you see my mirror um, that in atopical pneumonia, you can have these pictures without even in a, a negative uh, PCR test. Next slide, and that's the reason um, why we extend this. So that's only a summary uh, of surgery. We do surgery even laparoscopically in endometrial cancer, for instance. We use single trocars. We try to reduce everything. Um, 
and even in our outpatient setting you see we change some infrastructures and again uh, be aware try to check your infrastructures we continue our twinkle trials beside placebo controlled trials and thank you very much for your attention i'm happy to discuss with you the next uh, questions okay Jalid, thank you very much for a great, great lecture. Sorry we're, uh, we're out of time. Of course, we can spend a lot of time of all of these slides. Um, I'd just like to, to move on. Uh, Anne Gerda from Norway. How are you uh, triaging a patient with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer these days? Is it different from your regular standard of care? Are you using more neoadjuvant chemotherapy due, due to OR availability, for instance? So uh, we've been very, very lucky in Norway. You know, I have to acknowledge that we are a high resource country and also a country where we're not particularly overpopulated. We have about five point something million people. Um, so it's been um, very eff effective for our government to give guidelines in regards to, you know, closing schools and universities and, and really keeping people at home. Um, so Initially, when we didn't really know what the curve was going to look like, um, we did discuss the possibility of possibly using more neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, thinking that if you had um, very advanced surgery, that the resources in the intensive care units might be overloaded. Um, however, thankfully, this hasn't had to happen. Um, we have four health regions in the country. In the Radium Hospital, we cover about 60% um, of women with uh, GYN cancers in Norway, um, and they're all referred to us for surgery. So we see all these ovarian cancer patients. Um, we all have a CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, lab work, um, always a preoperative biopsy for histology. And then we will go through during tumor board. Our tumor boards have uh, changed slightly. There are a few of us present. Um, I think like Dr. Suhuli mentioned, you know, you could also invite people to um, attend via video conference um, to allow everybody to take part. But we've um, just limited the number of um, people present at tumor boards um, because of social distancing. And um, we really use the same triaging as we have used um, previously. What we do see though, and which is really concerning is um, fewer referrals. And we know that that's um, not due to a decrease in the incidence of um, these GYN cancers. And it's not because the patients are referred elsewhere because we are um, the centralized um, cancer care so you know we're very worried that we'll have loss of prognosis maybe stage migration because women are worried and they're sitting at home maybe not going to their general practitioner or their um, obstetrician or gynecologist with symptoms um, so i think time will show um, when we have a surge that affects, yeah, that affects their survival and, and treatment okay thanks uh, henny from south africa have you changed in any way the way you uh, approach patients with uh, endometrial cancer, low risk, high risk, uh, MIS, open surgery, imaging? Uh, maybe I can just explain in South Africa, we had a, we're now entering a fourth week of a very strict lockdown, um, which uh, means that we can't buy cigarettes, we can't buy alcohol, we're not allowed to go outside to exercise. So many factors work together to, um, to actually get the effect that we, we had to change our clinical practice um, because patients can't come to hospital um, as easily as before. But to answer your question about endometrial cancer, <clears throat> in the beginning we thought we'd uh, postpone uh, patients, um, but that's also not possible to postpone them indefinitely because it, it might, COVID might be with us for the next few months. Um, so we need to at some point make a decision. Um, actually the hospital is empty. Um, we have theater time, um, let's go ahead. We, we've been asked to reduce our theater time significantly, so it does create problems in terms of waiting times. Um, but so far, we haven't really changed our, our, our practice. Um, in terms of imaging, we've always been fairly economic um, with, with imaging, especially for staging for our um, cervical cancer cases, because in South Africa, we see a lot of cervical cancer, so we do um, routinely a chest x-ray and an abdominal um, ultrasound um, as part of our um, staging workup. We don't do routine CTs or MRIs on everyone. Um, so in that sense, we're already quite um, economic, but um, due to a shortage of um, uh, outpatient cystoscopy, we now um, 
permitting outpatient cystoscopy as part of our workup for locally advanced heart cancer. So certain things we've changed, but uh, we try and um, continue within the sort of available uh, limitations of the of the COVID epidemic. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, uh, Dr. Ram, Thomas from yeah, India. Um, what about radiation, adjuvant radiation for endometrial cancer patients? We've, we've been asked this from the attendees. Um, you know, whole pelvic radiation therapy, uh, IVRT. We, we, there's a question about the benefit, but during this whole pandemic, um, do you postpone, do you delay? H how do you treat these patients? Yeah, so, yeah, that's, uh, again, an interesting scenario for us. And uh, as far as uh, the policy, what we have uh, in our institution and what we have been told uh, at a national level policy is uh, that uh, cancer surgery is an essential surgery. And uh, we have an infrastructure within our institution where the continuum of care of endometrial cancer patients is given as per standard of care. So our gynae oncology surgeons, they are able to operate on our endometrial cancers and hence uh, we are getting referrals uh, for the patients who need adjuvant uh, therapy. And uh, deciding about, uh, you know, postponing the therapy or, you know, canceling the therapy, actually it uh, also depends upon the entire resources, say, within our radiation oncology department. Uh, if our resources are constrained, when I say it's constrained, mainly because we are trying to rotate our technology staff uh, within the department and if for some reason if we have a resource constraint based on the staff uh, availability though so for some of the patients uh, who need actually some of this treatment uh, especially like uh, you know the high risk uh, cancers who need uh, whole pelvic radiation if possible uh, we may delay it uh, you know by a couple of uh, weeks or at least uh, one month and also there are some borderline uh, patients whom we give an option of say uh, vault bracket therapy or observation uh, in those patients we have a discussion with them and there's an option for them uh, to just keep on uh, surveillance so these kind of adaptations uh, uh, it is happening uh, but the continuum of care continues and uh, uh, we are not really making too much of a variation in our standard of care for endometrial cancers okay good and Gerda can I ask you um, we've been asked about uh, what, what we think happens with training. I mean, definitely training of fellows, uh, residents, medical students is affected. Um, what do you think, what are your thoughts about that and, and what can be done? Um, I think this is particularly important if this is an ongoing uh, pandemic that will last for months. You know, I think if you have a, a short break in your training or maybe a change now for a few weeks while we all get this under control, um, our residents and fellows are learning other aspects of the care and maybe some of these ethical discussions we're having in triaging. Um, but I do think that as far as um, hands-on training, you know, because the tumor boards, you can, we can all do this via video conferencing, um, but hands-on training... It depends on your structure and maybe we have to think about different structures. Our trainees, they have um, their own independent outpatient clinics, so they continue with those just like we do as attendings, um, although we have moved to teleconferences and phones um, for um, our follow-up visits, uh, the ones where we feel that we don't necessarily have to do a physical exam. And our new visits we will see, and then with the appropriate um, protective equipment if it's, uh, if it's needed. Um, in the OR, um, it depends also on your setting, you know, having trained as you have in the United States, we're always three doctors um, during surgery. Um, in Norway, that's not the case. There's two of us um, and commonly um, there's an attending and a trainee. So uh, in that sense, it really hasn't affected the training to a large degree. Um, but I think maybe increasing the number of discussions with uh, teleconferencing is good for um, training purposes. Okay. Thomas, I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, and we've got this a lot from the audience, about uh, uh, the challenges of, uh, to the patients during this pandemic. Challenges financially, challenges of travel, even local travel can be difficult. W what is your take in India of this issue? Uh, yes, again, um, uh, what I can say is uh, there are various environments in which a uh, patient receives uh, cancer care. 
uh, like some of the centers uh, in India, the place where I practice, and I also know one uh, center which is uh, one of the largest centers, Tata Hospital in Mumbai, where we get a lot of uh, patients who come from different states uh, and they come and receive treatment here. And quite a few of them have been in our city and we know that we have a national lockdown in India right now. So most of these people are unable to leave uh, the city where they are right now with us. And so I and already we have quite a few patients actually uh, who have to have their cancer care, which is out of pocket treatment. And normally uh, the out of pocket treatment for uh, normal cancer care, it's, it, co it causes a lot of financial toxicity. But now with this new unusual scenario in front of them, uh, most of them are stuck and they have to stay in uh, hotel rooms and they had come with limited finances uh, to manage their day-to-day -day living uh, and the food. So we are seeing uh, this is all the socioeconomic and the food related issues are also a huge problem uh, for our patients. And fortunately, uh, our, our government has put in systems in place where they have created what they call as community kitchens where these kind of patients who are challenged because of the food related issues they can approach and they can receive uh, the food which is required for them but more than that they also have issues about uh, paying the rent for the rooms when they're staying in a hotel uh, but again uh, the government has uh, introduced a very uh, strong policy and they have instructed the hotel owners or the motel owners uh, that to defer uh, the rent payments from the uh, patients. So it is a huge, huge problem what we are facing. Uh, apart from the disease-related uh, morbidity, uh, I can see a socio-economic, uh, financial, and a huge economic morbidity which is unfolding uh, in front of us. And uh, it is scary because once this situation uh, changes and once these patients are able to go back to the place, uh, the whole dynamics of employment, because most of the of these patients who come also, uh, some of them are what they call is like, uh, they work on daily wages. And if there's a job, uh, they get their uh, salary for that day. So I foresee uh, that uh, not only during this time, but in the near future, we are going to have a huge, huge issue of financial toxicity and uh, social toxicity to our patients. Navya, and yeah, can I ask you, thank so, you, Thomas. Thanks. I, I, sorry, I, we have to yeah. move on. I just want to ask Navya one, one last question. Um, we've got this uh, from the attendees. Uh, how do you deal with emergency surgery? Do you, have you had any experience during this era? Are you practicing uh, surgery in a different way when it's emergent? Yeah, I mean, emergency surgeries we are still doing. Now our testing ability has really ramped up and every patient going to the operating room is getting a rapid test that we have a turnaround time of 45 minutes. Um, oh, so, so they're all getting tested. So now we actually know going into the surgery if they have it or not. That, that helps a lot. Um, and maybe one last question, Henny. Um, we might in this area, era have to uh, change some of the FIGO guidelines that, that we go by. What do you think, for instance, about uh, uh, vulvar cancer, small vulval cancer, just doing under local anesthesia and deferring, deferring nodes? Just in a sentence or two, please. Um, I think one should be very careful with vulvar cancer not to um, underdiagnose um, lymph node metastases because the, the consequences are um, enormous. But um, I think under local anesthetic, if we can do um, proper um, central node detect, uh, detection, we could potentially even do a central node um, dissection under local anesthesia. I think that's possible. Local uh, or maybe regional. Uh? Local or regional maybe. Exactly, sort of inguinal femoral node um, could, could potentially be um, removed a single node under, under local anesthesia. So I think um, you make a good point. I think um, FIGO and vulva cancer is still a controversial issue. I think we need some, we need to do some work um, in terms of the the staging, um, the FIGO staging for vulva cancer. I think we need a we need a better system. Jalid, any any last thoughts? Couple words. No, thank you very much. I'm I'm totally agree, and um, so I, I hope we can do what we really want to do and uh, even to prioritize in a center, yes.
And um, I hope even that testing will become better because it's not so safe as we wanted to have it. At the end of the day, we have to protect even our medical stuff. So at the end of the day, if we really believe this is our, our challenge, then we have even to use all protective materials. So that's, I think, if we have it available, we should use it much more than um, before. Definitely. So I'm gonna close it off. Uh, as the hour comes to a close, I want to thank our speakers and panelists for the time and insight today. I would also like to thank all of you for attending. Uh, we've got uh, dozens of questions from the from the audience during the show, and of course, uh, unluckily, we couldn't we didn't have time for all of them. As a reminder, the next tumor board of the series will take place a week from today on Saturday, April 25th, and will feature a different case, a different didactic, and a speaker panel. Registration is required for the next session, and a friendly reminder: if there are questions you would like addressed next week, you may submit them during the registration process, and the team will do their best to address. In the interim, we encourage you to continue the dialogue on the COVID-19 discussion forum within the IGCS membership community website. You can find all the resources, resources as well as today's recording online at igcs.org slash COVID-19. I'd also like to thank Mary, Kathy, Mandy, Susan, Dr. Salini, for the, and the rest of the IG, IGCS dedicated team for making the session possible. We wish you all continued health and safety.